Chapter 9 of The Forgotten Planet by Mary Leinster. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. There is such a thing as sunshine. The sun that shone upon the forgotten planet was actually very near. It shone on the top of the cloud bank, and the clouds glowed with dazzling whiteness. It shone on the mountain peaks where they penetrated the mist, and the peaks were warmed and there was no snow anywhere despite the height. There were winds here where the sun yielded sensible heat. The sky was very blue. At the edge of the plateau, from which the cloud banks were down instead of up, the mountainsides seemed to descend into a sea of milk. Great undulations in the midst had the semblance of waves, which moved with great deliberation toward the shores. They seemed sometimes to break in slow motion against the mountain walls, where they were cliff-like, and sometimes they seemed to flow up gentler inclinations like water flowing up a beach. But all of this was very deliberate indeed, because the cloud waves were sometimes twenty miles from crest to crest. The look of things was different on the highlands. This part of the unnamed world no less than the lowlands, had been seeded with life on two separate occasions. Once the seedings was with bacteria and molds and lichen to break up the rocks and make soil for them, and once with seeds and insect eggs and such living things as might sustain themselves immediately they were hatched. But here on the highlands the different climatic conditions had allowed other seedlings and creatures to survive together. Here molds and yeasts and rusts were stunted by the sunlight. Grasses and weeds and trees survived instead. This was an ideal environment for plants that needed sunlight to form chlorophyll, with which to make use of the soil that had been formed. So on the highlands the vegetation was almost earth-like, and there was a remarkable side effect on the fauna which had been introduced in the same manner and at the same time as the creatures down below. In coolness which amounted to a temperate climate, there developed no such frenzy of life as made the nightmare jungles under the clouds. Plants grew at a slower rate than fungi, and less luxuriantly. There was no vast supply of food for large-sized plant-eaters. Insects which were to survive here could not grow to be monsters. Moreover, the nights here were chill. Very many insects grow torpid in the cool of a temperate zone night, but warm up to activity soon after sunrise. But a large creature, made torpid by cold, will not revive so quickly. If large enough, it will not become fully active until close to dark. On the plateau, the lowland monsters would starve in any case, but more, they would have only a fraction of each day of full activity. So there was a necessary limit to the size of the creatures that lived above the clouds. To humans from other planets, the life on the plateau would not have seemed horrifying at all, save for the absence of birds to sing and a lack of small mammals to hunt or merely to enjoy the untouched, sunlit plateau with its warm days and briskly chill nights would have impressed most civilized men as an ideal habitation. But Burl and his followers were hardly prepared to see it that way at first glance. If told about it in advance, they would have thought of it with despair. But they did not know beforehand. They toiled upward, their leader moved by such ridiculous motives of pride and vanity, as have caused men to achieve greatness throughout all history. Two great continents were discovered back on Earth by a man trying to get spices to hide the gamey flavor of half-spoiled meat, and the power that drives mile-long spacecraft was first discovered and tamed by men making bombs to destroy their fellows. There were precedents for foolish motives producing results far from foolishness. 
The trudging, climbing folk crawled up the hillside. They reached a place high above the valley Burl had led them to. The valley grew misty in appearance. Presently, it could no longer be seen at all. The mist they had taken for granted all their lives hid from them everything but the slanting stony wall up which they climbed. The stone was mostly covered by bluish-green rock tripe in partly overlapping sheets. Such stuff is always close behind the bacteria which first attack a rock face. On a slope, it clings while soil is washed downward as fast as it is formed. The people never ate rock tripe, of course. It produces frightening cramps. In time, they might learn that when thoroughly dried, it can be cooked to pliability again and eaten with some satisfaction. But so far, they knew neither dryness nor fire. Nor had they ever known such surroundings as presently enveloped them. A slanting, rocky mountainside, which stretched up frighteningly to the very sky. Grayness overhead, grayness also to one side, the side away from the mountain. An equal grayness below. The valley from which they had come could no longer be seen, even as a different shading of the mist. And as they scrambled and trudged after Burl, his followers gradually became aware of the utter strangeness of all about them. For one result, they grew sick and dizzy. To them it seemed that all solidity was slowly tilting. Had they been superstitious, they might have thought of demons preparing to punish them for daring to come to such a place. But, quaintly enough, Burl's followers had developed no demonology. Your typical savage is resolved not to think, but he does have leisure to want. He makes gods and devils out of his nightmares and gambles on his own speculations to the extent of offering blackmail to demons if they will only let him alone, or, preferably, give him more of the things he wants. But the superstitions of savages involve the payment of blackmail in exact proportion to their prosperity. The Eskimos of Earth lived always on the brink of starvation. They could not afford the luxury of taboos and totem animals whose flesh must not be eaten, and forbidden areas which might contain food. Religion there was among Burl's people, but superstition was not. No humans anywhere can live without religion, but on Earth Eskimos did with a minimum of superstitions. They could afford no more, and the humans of the forgotten planet could not afford any at all. Therefore they climbed desperately, despite the unparalleled state of things about them. There was no horizon, but they had never seen a horizon. Their feeling was that what had been down was now partly behind, and they feared lest the toppling universe ultimately let them fall toward that grayness they considered the sky. But all kept on. To lag behind would be to be abandoned in this place where all known sensations were turned topsy-turvy. None of them could imagine turning back, even old Tama, whimpering in a whisper as she struggled to keep up, merely complained bitterly of her fate. She did not even think of revolt. If Burl had stopped, all his followers would have squatted down miserably to wait for death. They had no thought of adventure or any hope of safety. The only goodnesses they could imagine were food and the nearness of other humans. They had food. Nobody had abandoned any of the dangling ant bodies. Tet and Dick had distributed before the climb began. They would not be separated from their fellows. Burl's motivation was hardly more distinct. He had started uphill in a judicious mixture of fear and injured vanity and desperation. There was nothing to be gained by going back. The terrors at hand were no greater than those behind, so there was no reason not to go ahead. They came to a place where the mountain flank sank inward. There was a flat space, and behind it a winding canyon of sorts 
like a vast crack in the mountain's substance. Burl breasted the curving edge and found flatness beyond it. He stopped short. The mouth of the canyon was perhaps fifty yards from the lip of the downward slope. So much space was practically level, and on it were toadstools and milkweed, two of them, and there was food. It was a small, isolated asylum for life such as they were used to. They could, it was possible that they could, have found a place of safety here. But the possibility was not the fact. They saw the spider web at once. It was slung between the opposite canyon walls by cables all of two hundred feet long. The radiating cables reached down to anchorages on stone. The snare threads winding out and out in that logarithmic spiral whose properties men were so astounded to discover were fully a yard apart. The web was for giant game. It was empty now, but Burl saw the telegraph cord, which ran from the very center of the web to the webmaker's lurking place. There was a rocky shelf on the canyon wall. On it rested the spider, almost invisible against the stone, with one furry leg touching the cable. The slightest touch on any part of the web would warn it instantly. Burl's followers accumulated behind him. Old John's wheezing was audible. Tama ceased her complaints to survey this spot. It might be, it could be, a haven, and she would have to find new and different things to complain about in consequence. The spider web itself, of course, was no reason for them to be alarmed. Web spiders do not hunt. Their males do, but they are rarely in the neighborhood of a web save at mating time. The web itself was no reason not to settle here, but there was a reason. The ground before the web, between the web and themselves, was a charnel house of murdered creatures. Half-inch thick wing cases of dead beetles and the cleaned-out carapaces of other giants. The ovipositor of an ichneumon fly bee feet of springy, slender, deadly pointed tube, and the abdomen plates of bees, and the draggled antenna of moths and butterflies. Something very terrible lived in this small place. The mountainsides were barren of food for big flying things. Anything which did fly this high, for any reason, would never land on sloping, foodless stone. It would land here and very obviously it would die, because something, something, killed things as they came. It denned back in the canyon where they could not see it. It dined here. The humans looked and shivered, all but Burl. He cast his eyes about for better weapons than he possessed. He chose for himself a magnificent lance, grown by some dead thing for its own defense. He pulled it out of the ground. It was utterly silent here on the heights. No sounds from the valley rose so high. There was no noise except the small creakings made as Burl strove to free the new, splendid weapon for himself. That was why he heard the gasp when somebody uttered in default of a scream that would not be uttered. It was a choked, a strangled, an inarticulate, sobbing noise. He saw its cause. There was a thing moving toward the folk from the recesses of the canyon. It moved very swiftly. It moved upon stilt-like, impossibly attenuated legs of impossible length and inconceivable number. Its body was the thickness of Burl's own, and from it came a smell of such monstrous fetter that any man smelling it would gag and flee, even without fear, to urge him on. The creature was a monstrous millipede, forty feet in length, with features of purest, unadulterated horror. It did not appear to plan the spring. Its speed of movement did not increase as it neared the tribe's folk. It was not rushing like the furious charge of the murderers Burl's tribe knew. It simply flowed sinuously toward them with no appearance of haste, but at a rate of speed 
they could not conceivably outrun. Stick-like legs twitched upward and caught the spinning body of an ant. The creature stopped and turned its head about and seized the object its side legs had grasped. It devoured it. Burl shouted again and again. There was a rain of missiles upon the creature, but they were not to hurt it, but to divert its incredibly automaton-like attention. Its legs seized the things flung to it. It was not possible to miss. Ten, fifteen, twenty of the items of small game were grasped in mid-air, as if they were creatures in flight. Burl's shouting took effect. His people fled to the side of the level lip of the ground. They climbed frantically past the opening of the valley. They fled toward the heights. Burl was the last to retreat. The monstrous millipede stood immobile, trapped for the moment by the gratification of all its desires. It was absorbed by the multitude of tiny tidbits with which it had been provided. It was a fact to Burl's horror that he debated a frantic attack upon the monster in its insane absorption. But the strangling stench was deterrent enough. He fled, the last of his band of fugitives, to leave the place where the monstrous creature lived and prayed. As he left it, it was still crunching the small meals, one by one, with which the folk had supplied it. They went up on the mountain flank. It was not to be supposed, of course, that the creature could not move above the slanting rock surface. Unquestionably, it roamed far and wide, upon occasion. But its own fetid reek would make impossible any idea of trailing the humans by scent, and climbing desperately as the humans did, it would be unable to see them when they were past the first protuberance of the mountain. In twenty minutes they slackened their pace. Exhaustion prompted it. Caution ordered it, because here they saw another small island of flatness in the slanting universe, which was all they could see save mist. It was simply a place where boulders had piled up, and soil had formed, and there was a miniature haven for life other than molds, which could grow on naked stone. Actually, there was a space a hundred feet by fifty on which wholly familiar mushrooms grew. It was a thicket like a detached section of the valley itself. Well-known edible fungi grew here. There were gray puffballs, and from it came the cheerful, loud chirping of some small beetle arrived at this spot nobody could possibly know how, but happily ensconced in a separate bit of mushroom jungle, remote from the dangers of the valley. If it was small enough, it would even be safe from the reeking horror of the canyon just below it. They broke off edible mushrooms here and ate, and this could have been safety for them, save for the giant millipede no more than half a mile below. Old John wheezed querulously that here was food, and there was no need for them to go further. Just now, here was food. Burl regarded him with knitted brows. John's reaction was natural enough. The tribesfolk had never tended to think of the future because it was impossible to make use of such planning. Even Burl could easily enough have accepted the fact that this was safety for the moment and food for the moment. But it happened that to settle down here until driven out would, and at this moment, have deprived him of the authority he had so recently learned to enjoy. You stay, he said haughtily to John. I go on to a better place where nothing is to be feared at all. He held out his hand to Saya. He assailed the slope again, heading upward in the mist. His tribe followed him, Dick and Ted, of course, because they were boys, and Burl led on to high adventures in which so far nobody had been killed. Dor followed because, he being the strongest man in the tribe, he had thoughtfully realized that his strength was not as useful as Burl's brains and other qualities. Corey followed because she had children, and they were safer where Burl led them than anywhere else. The others followed 
to avoid being left alone. The procession toiled on and up. Presently, Burl noticed that the air seemed clearer here. It was not the misty, only half-transparent stuff of the valley. He could see for miles to right and left. He realized the curvature of the mountain face. But he could not see the valley. The mist hid that. Suddenly he realized that he saw the cloud bank overhead as an object. He had never thought of it specifically before. To him, it had been simply the sky. Now he saw an indefinite lower surface, which yet definitely hid the heights toward which he moved. He and his followers were less than a thousand feet below it. It appeared to Burl that presently he would run into an obstacle which would simply keep him from going any further. The idea was disheartening. But until it happened, he obstinately climbed on. He observed that the thing, which was the sky, did not stay still. It moved, though slowly. A little higher, he could see that there were parts of it which were actually lower than he was. They moved also, but they moved away from him as often as they moved toward him. He had no experience of any dangerous things which did not leap at its victims. Therefore, he was not afraid. In fact, presently he noticed that the whiteness which was the cloud layer seemed to retreat before him. He was pleased. Weak things like humans fled from enemies. Here was something which fled at his approach. His followers undoubtedly saw the same thing. Burl had killed spiders. He was a remarkable person. This unknown white stuff was afraid of him. Therefore, it was wise to stay close to Burl. Burl found his vanity inflamed by the fact that always, even at its thickest, the white cloud stuff never came nearer than some dozens of feet. He swaggered as he led his people up. And presently there was brightness about them. It was a greater brightness than the tribesfolk had ever known. They knew daylight as a grayness in which one could see. Here was a brightness that shone. They were not accustomed to such brightness. They were not accustomed to silence, either. The noises of the valley were like all the noises of the lowlands. They had been in the ears of every one of the human beings since they could hear at all. They had gradually diminished as the valley dropped behind them. Now, in the radiant white mist, which was the cloud layer, there were no sounds at all, and the fact was suddenly startling. They blinked into brightness. When they spoke to each other, they spoke in whispers. The stone underfoot was not even lichen-covered here. It was bare and bright and glistened with wetness. The light they experienced took on a golden tint. All of these things were utterly unparalleled, but the stillness was a hush instead of a menacing silence. The golden light could not possibly be associated with fear. The people of the forgotten planet felt, most likely, that sort of a promise in this shining tranquility which before they had known only in dreams. But this was no dream. They came up through the surface of a sea of mist and they saw before them a shore of sunshine. They saw blue and sky and sunlight for the first time. The light smote their shins and brilliantly colored furry garments. It glittered in changing, ever more colorful flashes upon cloaks made of butterfly wings. It sparkled on the great lance carried by Burl in the lead, and the quite preposterous weapons borne by his followers. A little party of twenty humans waded ashore through the last of the thinning white stuff which was cloud. They gazed about them with wondering, astonished eyes. The sky was blue. There was green grass. And again there was sound. It was the sound of wind blowing among trees and of things living in the sunshine. They heard insects but they did not know what they heard. The shrill, small musical whirrings, the high-pitched small cries, which made an elfin melody everywhere, these 
were totally strange. All things were new to their eyes, and an enormous exaltation filled them. From deep-buried ancestral memories, they somehow knew that what they saw was right, was normal, was appropriate and proper, and that this was the kind of world in which humans belonged, rather than the seething horror of the lowlands. They breathed clean air for the first time in many generations. Burl shouted his triumph, and his voice echoed among the trees and hillsides. It was time for the plateau to ring with the shouting of a man in triumph. End of chapter 9